In this video, we will be learning about density curves and the properties of density curves. But before we talk about this, we have to do a bit of review. Let's say we have a room of 20 people, and we record each of their weights. Then, we take this information and create a histogram. Recall with any histogram, we can transform a regular frequency distribution into a relative frequency distribution. The only difference between these two is that a regular frequency distribution tells us the number of people within a given interval, whereas a relative frequency distribution tells us the proportion or percentage of data values within that same interval. For example, there are 6 people that weigh between 100 and 110 pounds, but we can also say that 30% of the people in our data set weigh between 100 and 110 pounds. To convert a frequency distribution into a relative frequency distribution, we first needed to know the total number of individuals we were working with. In this example, we are working with a total of 20 people. Next, we needed to determine the proportion of individuals in each interval. We did that by dividing the number of people in each interval by the total amount of people. This gave us our relative frequency values. Now you know that you have done this entire conversion process correctly if you add up the relative frequencies of each interval and they add up to 1. The total area of any frequency distribution is always equal to 1 or 100%. So what is a density curve anyways, and where does it come from? A density curve is just the curve that helps us visualize the overall shape of a distribution. If we take the histogram we just worked with, and if we draw a curve around its distribution, we have essentially made a density curve. This can be done with any type of histogram, with any shape, and with any form. And like a relative frequency distribution, density curves always have an area that is equal to 1 or 100%. Now you might be wondering, what's the point of a density curve anyways? Why don't we just stick to using histograms? Well, density curves have a few advantages over histograms. First of all, Density curves give us an idealized picture of a population or data set without considering irregularities and outliers. Because of this, it really gives us a great overall picture of the actual distribution and its tendencies. Secondly, the picture of a histogram really depends on how many intervals you have. The more intervals you have, the better you can see the distribution of the data. But with a density curve, you are not limited by the number of intervals there are, and you can actually have an infinite amount of intervals. And third, a smooth curve is generally easier to work with than a histogram, especially when you are working with very large populations. Now the use of density curves becomes more practical the larger your population is. If we made a histogram from data we collected from 50 people and drew a density curve over it, we have a lot of missing gaps. And because of that, our density curve can be inaccurate. Now imagine if we had a population of 100,000 people instead of 50. Because our population is so big, we can continuously reduce the length of each interval we have until we end up with so many intervals that we essentially end up with a histogram that can be accurately represented by a density curve. This is why density curves are so valuable. They aren't limited by these intervals, and they can be very useful when working with very large populations. We can also use density curves to make approximations. For example, if we have a density curve that represented the test scores of 1 million people, by looking at the curve, we can say that half of the people scored over 60 on this test. We can also say that a large majority of students scored between 50 and 70 because there is a lot of area contained within this region. We can also say that only a few students did very well on this test because there is only a small amount of area contained within the upper tail region of the curve. You'll know how to calculate these exact areas in an upcoming video. But now that you know what a density curve is, we have to go over some very important rules for having a valid density curve. In other words, we'll have to talk about the properties of a density curve. The first rule is that a density curve must lie on or above the horizontal axis. Density curves that are drawn along the y-axis or ones that dip below the x-axis are invalid. A density curve has to sit on the x-axis in order to be valid. The second rule is that the total area under the curve is always equal to 1. Now if I said that the total area was equal to 5, 12, 70, or any number other than 1, then I do not have a valid density curve. However, if I said that the total area was equal to 1 or 100%, then I do have a valid density curve. This is a very important fact and it's one worth remembering. Density curves come in many different shapes and sizes. Some are well known mathematically and others aren't. 
each type of density curve has its own name. A common density curve you might encounter is the uniform distribution. It is called this because each interval has the same frequency of data values and is uniform throughout the entire data set. We also have the triangular distribution, and it's called this because, well, it looks like a triangle. And most importantly, we have the normal distribution, also known as the bell curve. In statistics, this is the most important density curve that you should familiarize yourself with. We'll be talking a lot about this curve in the upcoming videos, but for now, it's very important that you understand the concept of density curves. So let's do some practice questions. Feel free to pause the video at any point so you can try these questions for yourself. Question number one. For the density curve below, approximately what percentage of people weigh exactly 150 pounds? A common mistake that students make in these types of questions is they see 150 on the graph. They draw a line and then they see that it lines up with 0.20. So they will say that the answer is 20%. Now this is incorrect. Remember that the total area of a density curve is always equal to 100%. This line definitely does not have an area of 20%. In fact, the area of this line is equal to 0 because a line has no width. As a result, the answer is equal to 0. Logically, this makes sense because realistically, no one will ever weigh exactly 150.000 pounds. Usually, you'll have some measurements very close to it, like 150.5, 150.70, 150.05, and so on and so forth. However, if I asked you what percentage of people weigh between 150 and 152 pounds, then we have this entire area to account for. We can actually get a rough estimate of this area. We know that the area of a rectangle is equal to the length times the width. We have a length of 0.15 and a width of 2. Multiplying these together gives us an answer of 0.30. However, we still have this top portion to account for. To estimate this area, we see that it is almost equal to half of a square. The area of a square is equal to its length times its width, which is equal to 0.05 times 2, which gives us 0.1 and half of 0.1 is equal to 0.05. Therefore, the total area is roughly equal to 0.05 plus 0.30, which is equal to 0.35. As a result, the percentage of people that weigh between 150 and 152 pounds is roughly equal to 35%. As I mentioned before, you'll know how to calculate these exact areas in an upcoming video using a different method. Question number two. For the uniform distribution below, what must be its width in order for it to be a valid density curve? We know that the area of a rectangle is equal to the length times the width. Algebraically solving for the width tells us that it is equal to the area divided by the length. We know that the area of any valid density curve is equal to 1. So the area is equal to 1. We have a length of 8. So 1 divided by 8 gives us an answer of 0.125. Question number 3. For the uniform distribution below, what proportion of values are located between 12.3 and 18.6? On the graph, 12.3 and 18.6 is located somewhere around here. This is our area of interest. Now we know that the area of a rectangle is equal to its length times its width. The length is equal to 18.6 minus 12.3, which gives us an answer of 6.3. And the width is equal to 0.05. Multiplying these together gives us an answer of 0.315. This means that the proportional values contained within this interval is equal to 0.315 or 31.5%. If you found this video helpful, consider supporting us on Patreon to help us make more videos. You can also visit our website at simplelearningpro.com to get access to many study guides and practice questions. Feel free to follow us on social media and I hope you have a nice day. Thanks for watching.